Hello everyone, my name is Sai Ning Xie. I'm a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Hope you enjoyed the tutorial talk so far. Here I'm going to present something with a little bit different flavor. Instead of exploiting or reorganizing the graph structures in data, here we're going to the network connectivity structure itself and try to explore what's the implications of graphs and how graph theory tools can help us to learn better representations. Before jumping to deep learning, I want to say that graphs are everywhere in the real world. Our internet is a graph, social network is a graph, so are our communications and also our biological systems. In fact, there is a quite large and mature scientific discipline called network science where people try to propose different algorithms to model real-world graphs. In biology, especially brain science, Graph structures are a topic of uh, central interests. For example, recent studies find that human brain networks exhibit as random but small world connectivity patterns, and it is a very active research area in neuroscience. Going back to AI, you probably know that deep learning descends from something called connectionism. The famous PDP book laid out the framework for deep learning in 1980s. And one of the eight key components, among things like activation function, propagation rule, is a pattern of connectivity among units. And this will be the main focus of this tutorial too. We'll start by revisiting some modern neural network designs from a graph structure perspective. The first one is the original Lynette, and this is perhaps a small detail that is not mentioned or remembered anymore. The connections between the S2 and C3 layers are actually not fully connected. In the Lynette, a handcrafted connectivity pattern was used. We can see the adjacency matrix on the right. So coding from the paper, the motivation of doing this is for different feature maps are forced to extract different, hopefully complementary features because they get different set of inputs. However, there's no experimental justifications whether this pattern can really help the performance. In AlexNet, as an engineering compromise, because Alex cannot train his network on one single GPU uh, back to that time, so he split the channels into two parts and train them individually on each GPU, uh, which yields the grouped con connectivity patterns. What's interesting is that um, without imposing any constraints, the two groups learn disentangled representations. This coincidentally confirms what has been claimed in the Lynette paper and suggests that connectivity really matters for representation learning. Later on, there are more complex varying patterns such as GoogleNet, where the key structure is the heterogeneous multi-branching. ResNext further modularized the design and used a homogeneous multi-branching, which can be efficiently implemented by a grouped convolution. If we still use the same graph adjacency matrix representation, we can see that ResNext represents a graph structure where the adjacency matrix uh, is a block diagonal matrix. It is flexible structure and actually depth-wise convolution is one of the special case where the adjacency matrix is strictly diagonal. So overall, we witnessed that the success of many modern neural networks is largely attributed to the graph structure. We have witnessed the transition from chain-like wiring patterns to complex structures that have multiple wiring paths. More recently, neural architecture search takes the development of neural architectures uh, to the next level. NAS shows very promising results by jointly searching wiring patterns and which operations to perform. We're not going to be discussing NAS research in this tutorial, but one thing worth mentioning is that the search space is really designed by hand and the possible connectivity patterns is restricted uh, in the general graph space. 
So for network structure design, we have seen so far, they are still based on chain-like structure and repeating modules. Can, can we expand our exploration and use more freeform graph structures? Uh, and given any type of adjacency matrix which defines a graph, can we build a neural network from it? And how do they perform? So this is the work we presented at ICCV last year uh, on exploring randomly wired neural networks for image recognition. So in traditional connectionist models, how computational networks are wired is crucial for building intelligent machines. In the early days of AI, pioneers including Turing, Minsky, and Rosenblatt all have explored randomly wired machines. Here we show several neural network architectures we designed on the right. Comparing to a standard ResNet architecture, our neural networks seem a bit crazy. We call our model run wire. But as we can, we'll see, the random graph structures can achieve highly competitive results on ImageNet benchmark. So how do we design crazy neural networks like this? The process mainly takes two steps. The first one um, is we generate a general graph. And the second step is we'll map it to a computable neural network. There are different ways to generate general graph. To remove any bias from us, we use three classical random graph models, the ER, BA, and WS model, which have very different priors and properties. Uh, we don't have time to go into the details, but I highly recommend you check out their Wikipedia pages at least. Um, they are all nature and science papers published in the 1990s and they are extremely fun in terms of different application scenarios. This is a demonstration of the generation process of the WS model of small word graphs. You first place every node in a regular ring lattice, and then you go through each node and rewire it with probability p. So when you increase p from 0 to 1, you get graphs with different properties. For example, if you have very small p-value, your graph will be more regular. If p is close to 1, the graph is more close to a totally random graph. And something in the middle, uh, they are called small world graphs, uh, because you will create these local clusters and some hops with many input and output edges. Okay, so we can generate a very diverse set of neural network wiring patterns due to different behaviors of the random graph generators. Now let me show you how we really translate a graph to a computable neural network. We first start from a general graph. Then we impose an order into the nodes and convert it to a deck. We then add an extra input and an extra output node. Now we map our nodes to transformations, for example, a separable convolution, and we map edges to just data flow. Finally, we use one graph to represent a stage in a convolutional neural network. So under a standard ImageNet low compute regime, um, without any random wiring, some deterministic generators perform poorly. Most of the random generators can work pretty well. However, different random graph generators achieved very different performance. In our exploration, the best performing uh, graph structure is actually the small world or WS model. We also did one experiment where we keep the wiring pattern fixed, but change the node computational operations. Different configurations have very high correlation, which suggests that network wiring plays a role orthogonal to the role of the chosen operations. So when comparing with state-of-the-art models, either hand-designed or using new architecture search, our randomly wired models can achieve very competitive results. 
Here are some takeaway messages. First, surprisingly random graph structures can work very well when translated into a computable neural network. Second, random graphs uh, are not prior free. We can actually encode many inductive biases in the random process and varying pattern matters. Finally, we suggest the transition from designing an individual network to designing a network generator similar to the transition from designing features to designing natural architectures. However, there are also some challenges um, in this work for us to keep exploring, exploring in this direction. Uh, the first one is we are really restricted to DAX uh, for the graph representation. And the second thing is we focus on the global structure like a stage, but this cannot really scale well due to the heavy computational cost. And finally, um, there is no graph theory understanding and implications to help us answer the question, why some graph structures are better than the others? So here I'm gonna present another work on this direction to address some of the problems. Um, this is a joint work with my intern Jashen at Stanford, his advisor Yuri, and also Kaiming and myself. So the high level motivation is to explore graph structures in neural networks uh, at the neural level. We all know underneath every neural network, there is a graph. But what graph representation shall we use in order to better answer the following questions? Is there a link between the graph structure and the neural network performance? If so, what are structural signatures of well-performing neural networks? And Finally, can these signatures generalize across tasks uh, in datasets? The common graph representation for neurons are computational graphs, which you are probably very familiar with. Um, using a multi-layer perceptron as a simple example, the key characteristic of this uh, computational graph representation is that a layer is represented as a bipartite graph from the input neurons to the output neurons. So existing neural network structure design, including those we have revisited in the first part of the talk, are all using this computational graph representation. However, the computational graph representation has some limitations. First, it is not general enough due to the DAG structure and bipartite um, property. A second, it is really disconnected with neuroscience discoveries. For example, the brain networks are less templatized, and it is well known that most information exchange happens bidirectionally among neurons uh, in, in biological system. Here, we propose a new graph representation called relational graph. We still use an MLP layer as an example. If we think the computation flow in the bipartite graph as a message passing process, where the input nodes will pass messages to the output nodes. We can use different representation to model the connectivity as a relational graph. So in your relational graph, the edges are not directed data flow anymore. And they represent the bidirectional information exchange between the input and output neurons. Another way to think about it is uh, we are really collapsing the uh, corresponding input and output nodes in the computational graph to focus on the relationships across different neurons. Here are some examples to illustrate what an edge in a relational graph uh, represents in the, in the original computational graph. So here, node 1 and 2 have a relational edge between them. It means information is exchanged between node 1 and node 2. We also add self loops uh, for each node by default, which means a straight information passing from uh, corresponding input nodes to the output nodes. So relational graph can represent um, a diverse set of architectures. For example, a fully connected layer on the left and a grouped uh, layer with the cardinality 2 on the right.
the relational graph is a conceptual reinterpretation of the underlying computational graph. Uh, the advantages include that there is no restrictions on graph structure anymore. Although we are focusing on uh, undirected graph in this work. Also, it is closer to the bidirectional information exchange uh, in neuroscience. So it is also worth noting that uh, because of the current hardware implementation, the training is still performed using backpropagation in the original computational graph. But the new representation provides an exciting new perspective for future development. Here's a small illustration comparing the computational graph and the relational graph. In the original computational graph, the messages, uh, basically the computed uh, activations, are um, directly passed from input to the output neurons and aggregated together. However, in the relational graph representation, we have an equivalent process where the messages are exchanged between two connected nodes, then aggregated together. So in our framework, it is also easy to model a multi-layer neural network as multiple rounds of message exchanges. For example, if we have a five-layer neural network, then in a relational graph, it is simply a five rounds of message exchange and aggreg aggregation between a fixed set of nodes. To formalize, the relational graph is a general representation uh, and can be instantiated in different ways. There are mainly four key components, including node feature, and the, the message function, the aggregation function, and the number of rounds of message exchange. By initiating those four components, a relational graph can capture neural network architectures of different kinds, from simple MLPs to deep ResNet. For example, in an MLP, uh, when the number of nodes equals the number of neurons, the node feature would be a scalar. The message function is just a mul multiplication. The aggregation function is summation followed by an activation function. And for a four-layer network, we'll have four rounds of message exchange. When the network becomes wider, we can still retain the same relational graph. The only change you need to make is to instantiate the node features uh, from a scalar to be a, to be a vector. To generalize to a convolutional neural network with image inputs, the node features can be instantiated as a tensor and message function becomes a convolution operation. Now we have the relational graph representation. We can now use graph structure mirrors to help, help us gain more insights. Um, here we choose two mirrors that are widely used in graph theory, a global statistics uh, called average path length and the local mirror called clustering coefficient. For details, please check out our paper, uh, but at a high level, it captures different structural properties of a graph. We also propose an extension of the original WS graph, which we call a WS flex, uh, in order to densely sample graphs from the space that, that is defined uh, jointly by the two graph mirrors. With relational graphs densely sampled from the space, we can now train them on a standard benchmark, such as CIFAR-10, and get a heat map of neural network performance against the graph mirrors. Here we train 4, 000, uh, around 4,000 MLP models with different relational graph structures and record um, the final classification accuracy. Each point here is average of five rounds using different random seeds. We also carefully control the flops of every architecture so that the performances are uh, comparable. So the first interesting finding 
is that the distribution of neural network performance is highly non-trivial in our graph space. We can find a sweet spot in the space uh, where graphs with the L is around 2.5 and C is around 0 0.4. Um, when the graph has such properties, they can really achieve top performance when trained on a CIFAR-10 dataset. This can be seen also from 1D slices of the 2D joint plot. The distribution along either uh, L and C shows a U-shaped curve, which potentially reveals that neural network performance is a smooth function over the two graph mirrors. Perhaps even more surprising and interesting, the sweet spot seems consistent across many different instantiations uh, and many different architectures. For example, we tried uh, MLP, we tried ResNet 34, and we tried a version with separable co uh, convolution. We also tried uh, ResNet 50 and efficient at B0. And in all those architectures, the correlation of performance for the same set of graphs, but with different architecture instantiations, are really, really high. We can also uh, identify the sweet spot quickly in the training process by sampling fewer graphs or training for fewer epochs. So interesting observations can be found when comparing our results with neuroscience discoveries. As we can see, the best graph for an MLP has a similar L and C value to a biological network, uh, a MERCAC co cortex. We can also use our relational graph representation to translate the biological network back to a neural network and train them again on CIFAR-10. It is very interesting that the biological networks can indeed achieve very good results. There are many potential directions to study graph structure of neural networks. Uh, feel free to let me know through emails if you have any questions. Thank you very much.